Campus Thrival Guide, where we cover all of the things that graduate school didn't teach you. My name is Miranda Barker, and I am a licensed clinical social worker. I have been practicing as a therapist for a little over a year, and I was in child protection before that. I am joined here with my co-host, Dr. Lucas Bellini, who has been a therapist for over 10 years. Yes, and I'm a professional recreational golfer. <laughs> As a reminder. <laughs> of course. We are here to talk about the topics that grad school did not prepare us for, wasn't included in grad school, but we want to share and talk about for new therapists. Or maybe you've been a therapist for a while and you're just, you know, wanting a refresher. Or maybe you just thought this topic sounded interesting. I don't know why you're here, but we're glad you're here. Um, I am here with our guest, Zoel Gonzalez. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Um, my name is Zoel Gonzalez. I'm an LPCC and uh, been here at Ellie for four and a half years and did uh, some arms work before for four years and some in-home therapy. And I'm just glad to be here. This is great. I'm glad that we get to talk about these things. We're glad you're here, Zoel. Thank you so much for sharing some of your expertise and yeah. And if you're a subscriber, you'll remember Zoel from the intro. Exactly. Episode number one. Way back at episode number one. That's crazy. Forever ago. That was a long time ago. Like five minutes ago? <laughs> For us. <laughs> For us. We recorded them both in one day. But I believe this is episode 17. <clears throat> so I wanted to bring Zoel to talk about some of these important topics because the first time I ever heard about Zoel, and I don't know if you if you know this, Lucas, but the first time I ever heard about Zoel was in a clinician shout out. So one of his clients wrote into Ellie and just spoke so highly of the work that Zoel does with him. And so I just wanted to read a small bit of it actually. So did did we warn Zoel about this? I did not warn Zoelle All about right. this, but it's so good. <laughs> but you'll listen to this and you'll say, yes, like, of course, we needed to have him on this show. It would be hard to overstate how life changing it has been to work with Zoelle. He provided a context to understanding my childhood and adult life in a way that I never would have. And he supported me to break out of harmful patterns. He's a kind and empathetic and patient person, and he never not. He not only never shames me, but tries to guide me to not shame myself. He provides practical tools and tips, but more than anything, a relationship with unconditional regard that's essential for healing attachment trauma. So when I read that, I was like, oh my word, I need to know who this clinician is wow. because the work you do is amazing. And and other people here at LA just talk so highly about you. So thank you so much for joining on this podcast. That, that almost, thank you. And that almost brought a tear to my eye. <laughs> yeah, me too, man. When, uh, I, I, when I read that the first time, it was so humbling. Hmm. Uh, I, I kept it just so I remind myself the possible work that we can do. Mm-hmm. And we don't, I don't think, most of us don't think of us that, in that manner, in that way. But we do have an impact. Absolutely. On others. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm glad. And it it can be rare to get that stuff too. Um, So not only do I appreciate the client for writing that in, but uh, Miranda, you for sharing that. Because, I mean, yeah, like that's the stuff that gets me. You know, like when it comes to a client's like trauma, like the depth of their suffering it's like i say composed and attuned you know and engaged um but when it comes to like their growth and their healing it's like that that's when i'll just become a <laughs> soppy mess <laughs> i love it so today we are talking about culture and therapy we wanted to talk a little bit about how about culture and how it impacts our lives as humans and the therapist and how it relates to the therapeutic process as well as relationship and connection with our clients. So, I don't know, which one of you wants to kind of start on this? We already started uh, <laughs> during the break. But yeah, this is a huge topic. Yeah. Uh, this is a massive topic. And so we'll, we'll see how much we can dig into today. I feel like today will be the beginning of an offshoot. You know, oh, kind of thrival season because, yeah, there, there really is so much to dig into. And I think that's part of the problem is the way that our profession seem to teach culture 
you know, the way the literature talks about how you should and shouldn't use culture in session, it's, it doesn't even come close to how powerful culture is, you know, and it's, it's everything I learned about culture that's been super relevant to my clinical practice. I didn't learn any of it within the journals of marriage and family therapy, counseling, psychology, social work. Uh, it was, it was through world history, um, philosophy, cultural anthropology, uh, theology and religious studies. You know, it's, it's, it's classic literature, you know, like Dorzievsky, um, Nietzsche, you know, it's, 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 or uh, Tolstoy, like it's, it's, that just exploded my mind to the magnitude of culture and how every single human on this planet is powerfully governed by culture. It's just a matter of whether or not we're aware of it. I agree. Uh, I, I think I, I, I chose this topic because like you, Lucas, to me, it's one of the most important things to be aware of during therapy and, and anywhere you go in relationships and, um, you have to be mindful of it, in my humble opinion, how that impacts human beings and, and how that impacts also in the therapeutic relationship and process is highly relevant. Uh, and it's, we were talking about it, Lucas, before we started the podcast about how society tends to label culture in a certain way. And it's almost like there's a guidelines to it. And then if you follow those guidelines, then you have culture, you know, mm -hmm. but it goes beyond that. And so I dug a little bit into it. And what where, where does the word culture comes from? And the Latin word for culture is cultus. And cultus means to care. Then the French, uh, had another later on the French later had another meaning for the world world culture which is colere and colere means to cultivate to till the land so that's where I started because it's so vast right it's it's too much to talk about in an hour this is an eternity um, so but I, I picked those two meanings care and to cultivate and how does that show up in our own lives and in other people's lives? So I decided to, I did a lot of research and look for definitions and I Google it. I, I can bore you with a whole definition from Google what culture means. Um, but I decided to take a different route. And what I did is that in the last two weeks since I, you know, we, we talked about doing this podcast is to just interview people mm -hmm. and ask them. Yeah. what culture meant to them. I chose young people, uh, elderly, uh, young adults, professionals, friends, family, and even some strangers. And then then that's how kind of like I got a better understanding of what it means for, for others. And, and were they all different? Completely different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. so... Yeah, a lot of what, what you were saying, a uh, big one being, well, yeah, one, how, how we talk about culture currently, which is kind of through identity politics. You know, mm -hmm. it's like the uh, cult cultural narratives have been overwhelmed by competing political narratives or political ideologies, you know, and, and, and that's been that's been problematic, uh, especially when that's how we all start to see and organize around culture. But yeah, the other big piece, you know, I want to make sure we get to is... Um, it's like a, grad school and the literature almost teaches us to like be cautious with culture, mm -hmm. you know, and almost like stay away from it. You know, that when it comes to the client's culture, you know, it's like put on put on the white gloves, you know, and be very be, be cautious, you know, which I think just talks a lot of young therapists into just steering away from it altogether. When I think culture and the client's cultural worldview is both the most powerful avenue in assessment, you know, so when we're making sense of kind of who our clients are, where they're coming from, the more we can focus on the cultural aspects of it, you know, the more complete of an understanding, at least in what I found, we'll be, we'll be able to, uh, to generate. 
but also at the level of intervention. You know, it's like when we know how to use culture, you know, uh, purposefully and like in its totality and immenseness, like it can be one of the most powerful resources of healing that that I've ever experienced or seen or have been able to be effective with. Um, but yeah, that that's that's not quite how things have been going. So how like how 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 have the two of you been experiencing like the current not necessarily the cultural context of our professions, but the way culture is talked about within your profession. Um, it seems like we have to belong to either some sort of ethnicity or race or country. Uh, and, and, and that's the premise that we're coming, that we belong to to this more defined definition of culture, uh, but in, in in my in this profession, we I found that like as I was asking all these folks questions about culture, that they all gave me like you said, Lucas, different answers, and to them it meant something completely different, and it's morphing as well. Like some of the younger folks will tell me. Uh, well, it's we're we're making our own culture. Uh, the definition usually goes from generation to generation, traditions and all that kind of stuff that you pass from generation to, but not necessarily true. Uh, that's something that people can be creating as they go on in life. Um, so, in terms of profession and the field of being a therapist. Culture can be so can be used as some something that you, that the person identifies with. That it makes them. I will go back to these two words that cultivate something. That they care for something. So, uh, for me, if I make that connection as a therapist, okay. So what are you cultivating? Well, I like sports. You know, that's something I like and I care for. Okay, well, then I I can find something in me that maybe I can connect with and and, and create our own culture in that space. So it's con continuously morphing, it's changing, um, and it's vast. And I don't know if I answered your question or went on a tangent, but I'm thinking in professional, in, in that space, in that therapeutic space. Mm -hmm. So, so when you were saying, like, people need to, like, choose, and we just kind of put people into categories, like, whether it's race, ethnicity, sexuality, um, like, I agree entirely. That's That seems to be almost all we ever do, you know, but would you say that that's kind of as far as your uh, graduate education took you in it? Like, how did your grad program really, what did, what did your grad program teach you about culture? Well, the main book that we used was called Cultural Cultural Diversity by Sue and Sue. Yeah. It's a pretty standard. It's the standard counseling, it's standard. multicultural. And I book. went back to the book and start reading all the highlight pages. That, and it was, I didn't learn much. It was almost like a playbook of what, according to these two authors, culture should be viewed as. But it, it went back to ethnicity, race, gender, sexuality, ages, populations, demographics. But um, they never talked about how it, it's constantly changing. That is something that, that we are learning as we go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, and it doesn't really go into... Uh like how you can use it clinically mm. and how you can be effective, mm. you yep. know, and, and really using, again, the power of culture in our practice. And a lot of the models don't do that either. You know, like when it comes to multicultural trainings and multicultural aspects of therapy, it's like, here's, here's a model, you know, like let's say CBT. And so let's leave CBT as it is, but like slap some cultural competence on it. So like, let, so like these are ways we can be culturally competent as we do CBT, but the model and the interventions themselves 
don't really get, don't speak much to culture or go into culture at all. And so it gives us kind of like a false impression, I would say, that those two things are separate from one another. It's like, here's the model and intervention of change. And as we do it, let's be mindful of their culture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which, which, which is something I think I've always felt pretty strongly about uh, that we could be doing much better than that. But uh, what's, uh, what's going on in social work? <laughs> Y'all love talking about culture. Oh, yeah. How do you do it, though? So um, the first thing that came to mind is, did you all hear, like, did you all learn about culturograms in? Culturograms? Culturograms. Is that like social work's ripoff of the cultural genogram? No, it's different. Okay. So it's, <laughs> um, so it's essentially just like an eco map where it, it has various um, aspects of culture and and it's meant to be like an assessment tool. So you sit down with your client, kind of like how you might sit down with your client and be like, let's create a genogram and talk through some family relationships. But um, similarly, you might go through like a culturogram. I don't know if I'm even pronouncing it right and talk through some of those different aspects. But as you were talking, <laughs> I was thinking to myself about I I maybe did that like right when I first started working with different clients, but um, have not really used that much since. Um, and I, I think that there's certainly some flaws within that model, but lots of flaws within that model. But um, that is pretty much like the extent of my my conversations in grad school about how to you know begin these conversations or have conversations with clients of a different culture um and so I mean I have a lot of thoughts about that but I wanted to also do just like give a plug for a book that I found really helpful when I was when I was working when I was first working with um Native American clients and and it's called Healing the Soul Wound by uh, Eduardo Duran and that was just life changing for me about how to have cultural humility and um, walk into these therapeutic spaces as as someone who is white and not Native American and and working with people um, of that culture and how to again like have that cultural humility and um, you know have those hard conversations and and kind of address the elephant in the room and so I loved that book and would highly recommend it. Um, for new clinicians starting out because I think it's very applicable to um, other cultures and races beyond, you know, working with Native American folks. But And I, I do, I was always fond of kind of the shift away from cultural competency and our continued movement toward cultural humility. Mm -hmm. You know, in that, you know, cultural humility is, yeah, I think we're still a ways away from having like a universal consensus on what that means, you know, but I think culture, I think humility is a given once you get to the point of understanding culture. It's like you can't fully understand culture and all of its magnitude and not be incredibly humbled by it, you know, but like even that question of like, what is culture? Like describe culture, define culture. I would imagine a lot of people, or I would say based upon a lot of my teachings or the teachings I see going on out there, it's like we answer what culture is by describing culture, you know, whether it's like my cultural characteristics, their cultural characteristics or demographics, you know, but to answer that in a much more universal manner of, you know, it's like, no, not manifestations of culture. It's like, what is culture in and of itself? Like what, what role does it play in society and human development and to answer that question in a way that doesn't change based upon the cultural group or the individual you're asking, you know, but to understand culture as, as something larger that transcends all the things that make us different. Um, so from that regard, I mean, uh, yeah, how would each of us answer that question? Uh, so you talked about what is culture. I'm going to maybe get into it. I don't know how much time we have. But how would you say at this point, you would say, if, if I ask you, what is culture? Ugh. I mean, I think that I would go back to, you know, like the textbook definitions of like, well, it's a it's a combination of, um, you know, traditions, memories, um, important, 
you know, physical aspects or thing or in, in a, as, as well as non-physical aspects that would um, unite people in some way and, and give people a sense of belonging. Um, however, I mean, I think that I, I do lend like a, a, an odd perspective in this conversation because the majority of my clients were adopted. And so when I talk about culture in a, ther- in a therapy setting, it's a very different conversation. It's a conversation about identity and it's a conversation about kind of missing out on some of that belonging. Um, and so I don't know if I answered your question, but that's that's I think I I know the textbook definition, but it, it looks different in practice with my clients. For, for me, the um, there is a, the what I think the generic definition of it, which you can Google it and <laughs> it'll everybody will get the same definition um, is like you were saying, a. Uh, uh, Traditions, values, customs, religion, you can go on and on and on. But the key part that, according to Google, is that it's passed on from generation to generation. Mm. That's the key part. Um, so, but I'm discovering that not necessarily true. So that's why I ask many folks mm-hmm. of like, what is your definition, you know? And they all have their own unique definition, and I, I really appreciate each one of them because I also got to understand culture be- better from different types of folks, different people, people that come from different places that I do, you know. But one of the definitions that struck me the most was uh, this young man said, um, it's a, an accumulation of human experiences. Hmm. That hit hard. I was like, ooh, that's deep. Um, he didn't try to put traditions in it. He didn't try to box it up. He just said it's just an accumulation of human experiences for me. So that's beautiful. Who was that kid? Um, it was a 20-year-old kid, uh, Minnesotan. 20-year-old Minnesotan. Mm-hmm. Client cool. or family member or friend? A friend. Okay. A friend cool. of a friend. Yeah. Yeah. A, kind of a really smart kid. I love yeah. talking to him. Yeah, that's but, wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. So I learned a lot from that. And to me, that was like, okay, this is kind of making a little bit more sense of what, uh, if I can try to attempt to define culture, I will go this route. Okay. Someone asked me. Wait, before we go to that, <laughs> I want to hear, I want to hear more about some of these other responses as we're talking. Do you have other uh, examples of what other yes, people have said? But how about Lucas? <laughs> okay, fine. And right. then we'll go into <laughs> those right. if, perfect, if you guys perfect. are okay with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Lucas, what is culture? What I've come to find. <laughs> um, culture is the fundamental mechanism humans utilize to manage our collective existential terror. Like culture is, so another way to say that, or like the utilitarian component of what I just said is humans use culture to distinguish us from the animal world and the rest of nature to create an illusion that we are more significant Mm -hmm. and that there's more to this world that we can't even explain than what we can see because if we left it simply up to what we could see, how would we really be different than animals, you know, in any capacity? It's like we're here, we live, we satiate ourselves, we continue the species, and then we die. You know, it's like how many other animals can be explained from from that perspective, you know, but what humans have is this, uh, what biologically distinguishes us from the animal world, you know, not to say that this doesn't mean we're still not just as much of a part of nature as everything else is, um, is that our minds have the capacity to think symbolically and to be aware of the fact that we're going to die at some point in time when we're not in a state of kind of fight, flight, freeze. You know, like most animals, they don't even know they're mortal unless they're, there's an existential threat that they're trying to flee. Mm-hmm. And they know to flee it because um, they know if they don't, they'll be dead Mm -hmm. but then once they re-regulate it's like they're just pleasure seeking you know and surviving 
humans, it's like, we all know we're going to die. We all know that everybody we know and love is going to die. And so culture is like what, what we've developed to, to, to manage that, you know, to, to not necessarily accept that, to, to organize in a way where, yeah, we create something that's bigger than us, more profound than us. Um, but it's also gotten us into a lot of trouble. That is so interesting. No, that makes a lot of sense. Didn't think of it that way. Yes, yeah, uh, shout out Ernest Becker. Rest in peace. There was a, another another person who said it's a place of power, and I also had to wrestle with that idea. It can be a place can, of power, you know, be. if you believe mm-hmm. in power. Mm-hmm. Power is just a product of culture. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like there's there's not necessarily a universal truth to that. Um, you know, and that that is where things get messy is when we think about culture only at the level of particulars. You know, because when we only think about culture at the level of particulars, it's like it gets reduced to a matter of who's right and who's wrong. You know, when culture doesn't need to be a matter of who's right and who's wrong, it's like we're it's like we we don't have any idea what we're doing here. Our species, I mean, you know, it's like we're on a we're on a relatively like super like tiny ball floating in infinite space. Mm-hmm. We don't even know where the boundary is. We don't even know if there is a boundary. You know, it's like culture is how we make sense of that. Mm. But it's like nobody's right, nobody's wrong. Well, I mean, I think some people are mm-hmm. pretty sure the Earth's not flat. I'm gonna put that out there. <laughs> it's also. F- so much of meaning making yeah like how we find meaning in some of those ideas or how we find meaning as we're wrestling through these ideas and that is beautiful and that can mm-hmm. be so beautiful you know and that can be a huge part of what therapy is but it's hard because like if yeah like if the therapist has a world view that is based primarily on particulars it's going to be hard for us it's going to be hard for that therapist to explore in its depth like the client's worldview if it starts to go in a direction that opposes Mm -hmm. you know how they want things to be or it's like if you haven't really gone into the depths of culture and why you believe in what you believe in um is how how are you going to know how to take someone else there? Maybe I'll put this out there. This is so this is what I always use in trainings and classes. I think this really puts into perspective the power of culture. Um, so I just put up a vignette and I say, you know, imagine that if at birth you were born to whoever your parents are in the exact same you know setting and place, like nothing. Everything was the same about your life up until the point that you were delivered. At that time of birth, you're adopted to another family who lives in Nauru. And Nauru is like a super small island um, in uh, Micronesia. And it's like 60,000 people in the whole country. Uh, It's primarily uh, like a Christian country. Um, There's about four ethnic groups. You know, it's a pretty closed system. More people leave than come. Um, and so based upon that, what are the things you know about yourself to be true today that you would still know to be true with absolute certainty if that was your upbringing and your development? So everything you, everything you love, your hobbies, your interests, how you talk, how you dress, what you like, what would still be indisputably true about you? And that would be the, the essence of that person. In my opinion, you know, what makes you, you, Yeah. you know, so you can put the, you know, the culture to the side and, and what is the essence that constitute, constitutes who you are and um, with what has helped you uh, cultivate yourself, cultivate you. I'm going to keep going back mm-hmm. to those two words uh, because for me, that's that's kind of like my compass at this point. And, and it's all mm-hmm. – um, do you have an answer to that question, Barker? I was just going to say, like, that is, I think, a big essence of a, a lot of adoptee struggles when we are in this space talking about culture because 
Um, there's a lot of things that people make assumptions about when it comes to culture, especially if they, they expect you to fit within a box. Um, and I think that even I was talking to a client this week who was adopted um, from India and she was in a class where they were talking about um, anti-Asian hate and just a, a lot of stereotypes and things like that. And her professor knew that she had been adopted and didn't call on her to ask to to contribute to the conversation. She called on a couple of other people that were in the room. But um, my client was even just struggling with the fact of like, am I glad that I wasn't called on because I don't know what I would have said. Like, the, sure, there's a lot of things that I can speak to in this in this realm as as an Indian woman. But um, she was struggling just because she was like, I'm I'm glad I wasn't called on because that saved me some of the embarrassment of not knowing how to respond about some of these things. But then I'm also heartbroken that I wasn't called on because I don't know some of these things. And I think that for a lot of adoptees and a lot of people who were raised um, in a different culture than what they were born into, um, I mean, I think I think even some some multicultural families, you know, deal with some of this stuff too, where they the silence can speak louder than words, but then you're like, but then do I feel like I need to talk about this? And I don't know. I'm kind of going on a tangent, but kind of, but not. I mean, yeah, it's like we don't. We're so unsophisticated in how to talk about culture. Yeah, it's hard. And I think in some ways it, it, it is out of like respect, you know, it's Absolutely. like, yeah. And, and it's, that's, that's the intention, uh, far more times than not. But yeah, like even when, I think what's most interesting about what you're saying is like, you, is how the client didn't even know if that was good or bad. Mm -hmm. Was that a problem or like, was that a gift I got, yeah. you know, or did, was something taken away mm -hmm. from me? Um, but regardless, it was a reminder yeah. of that that difficulty and that trauma, that loss that she had been through, the loss of that of that culture. Oh that, yeah, it's like because it it was in her bones, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah. it's like that's how powerful culture can be. So like that question I asked, like I don't. What a lot of groups come to is like biological traits, like those are the only things that would be the same. And I think that they're like that's largely true. I mean, epigenetics, you know, there very well could have been certain genomes that didn't synthesize, you know, based upon different environmental experiences. Um, but I'm not satisfied with it just being a biological, you know, process. So like culture is powerful. Like we would be very likely very different people. Um, but there is a story. I think I told you this one, Miranda, I was in college. We were at a party. We went outside to smoke a Newport. And there's someone else sitting outside. And so I just sat down next to her. Uh, it was a, a Korean girl who went to a different uh, different university. And she just looked like she was, you know, being contemplative and cigarettes can be social. So I just sat next to her and I was like, I was, before I know it, we were in a conversation. Of, You've ruined her moment. No, it's a beautiful moment. Um <laughs> I think you know you know when people are approachable and when they just kind of want some time to themselves. Oh, yeah. She looked pretty open. Mm -hmm. um, but she started telling me how she was born at birth from uh, out of South Korea, grew up here in America, um, and she had never been back to South Korea like in, in her entire life. She had a great family. You know, it's like she loves her parents. She has siblings. Um, but when she got to college, you know, and she started meeting people from you know, different areas all over the, all over the country and learning more about culture. She was just getting like this very strong urge to go visit, uh, South Korea. And she said she had just gone back like two days ago. And she said the first night that I landed and she just went by herself. Uh, she said the first night that I got there, it was like, I just stayed in a cheap hostel and she's like, it was the worst sleeping conditions I've ever had to sleep in. Like it was like cots and bunks with a bunch of other people. And she said that was the first night in her life. She ever felt as if she truly slept. <laughs> and she said every other night she was there, she just, she just slept. Mm. 
-hmm. And she was like, it was so easy to sleep. Wow. You know, and she was like, like, it's like she, she, just the experience of being back in that environment and feeling it, you know, it's like, that leads me to believe that like, there are things that that culture almost like it can't manifest like in our bones Mm where like our body knows when we're back there and when we're not. And so the last thing I asked her, I never talked to her again after this. Um, I never saw her again. I was like, I was like, how do you sleep now? And she was just like a lot better. That is so interesting. Yeah. I see a, I see a client who is from, uh, and, and remind you guys, I'm not even from here, Minnesota. I'm from Puerto Rico. And I lived in, in Mexico City and Spain and then eventually grew up in Puerto Rico. Um, so exposed to a lot of different countries. Um, so I'm curious naturally about other people's or upbringing, where they come from. And so I never really had a client from the South, uh, Mississippi, and an African American in her 50s uh, that was that grew up in Mississippi. And during during our relationship and learning how to trust each other and 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 come to a comfortable place where we can really do more therapy. Uh, that took a long time. Um, she was not willingly open to discuss personal things. But at the same time, the way she communicated almost sounded aggressive to me and almost taking shots at me uh, quite often. So I, I got to the point where I asked her because I was curious about how she communicated with me. And I knew there was something besides just taking shots at me. There had to be something else here. And that, I think that's like cultural humility. But I didn't know that I was experiencing that at the time. So I straight up ask her. Um, so I noticed that you say certain things. And I'm kind of like, are you trying to like take some shots at me here? Like, are you, are you not digging me? You don't like me? She goes, no, no, honey. It's I'm inviting you. As a family member, this is how we talk in our family. Um, my brain went to the stereotypes. Oh, so it must be because she's black and she's from the South and they, that's how they talk down there. But I was completely wrong. I had nothing to do with that. It was her essence. She was inviting me into her world, mm-hmm. her upbringing, uh, to her family. And I took it the wrong way. And ever since then, now she still takes those kind of shots at me, but I don't take them as shots. I just take them as compliments. <laughs> yeah, or an open door to fire right back <laughs> if they are shots. I haven't done that yet, but uh, we're getting we're uh, getting close. Well, for as much as it sounds <laughs> like she dishes out, she better be able to take it uh, in return because that's um, uh, <laughs> that could get problematic, you know. But you said you. I think you handled that beautifully, you know, because like your body felt that initial sense of like, oh, that doesn't feel good. But it's like what your body was telling you was like she's violating a cultural norm that you adhere to. Yes. Um, And so when someone violates a cultural norm that we adhere to, it feels uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, it's like we, we get that visceral reaction oftentimes. But the biggest mistake we can make in that moment is to then judge that violation of the cultural norm that we've accepted based upon the teachings of our specific worldview. Mm-hmm. Uh, what you did instead was maintain a state of curiosity, you know, to, to wonder what that was about. It's like, maybe that's not a violation of my cultural, you know, or it, it's like that might be a violation of my cultural standards and norms, but maybe that's okay. Because mm-hmm. even though my culture says that's not okay to do or you shouldn't do that, you know, what it sound, What ended up happening was her culture, you know, took that as uh, a component of like friendliness and joining and engaging. Um, and so in that regard, it's like you, you still have two different, you, you still have the same teaching. And this is where universals and particulars play out. So like the universal there is there are certain ways that we communicate to people that we like them, that I trust you and that you're accepted. The particulars between the two of you is just two different methods of doing that, you know, but it's like so often we get caught up and there being two different methods as being the problem. When at the end of the day, it's like, we're both doing the same thing that we both agree, agree about. 
It just requires us to maintain that state of humility and curiosity to get to a point where we can discover that. Yeah, and be on, be okay with being uncomfortable in that space. Yeah. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be uncomfortable. Because every you know? anytime we open ourselves up to the worldview of another person, it's inescapably going to challenge and disrupt our worldview. And yeah. it's like, we that's what we have to figure out how to be okay with. You know, because this cultural stuff gets messy when people refuse for any component of their worldview to be questioned or challenged. Um, they need to believe in it as an absolute truth, you know, and anything outside of it is, is a threat. You know, I'd say that's one of the most unevolved ways to look at culture. Uh, and I say it's unevolved because, again, it's tiny ball, infinite space. We have no idea what we're doing here. Um, there's no chance that, but yeah, it's like the ratio of is, you know, there's what, 450 religions. Um, it's like the odds of one of them being totally right and the rest of them wrong is like zero. But we are not talking about religion right now. <laughs> that's not talking about like religion. That's just statistics. Sure. I just didn't want us to get derailed into that conversation. But also, no, I would say that's a problem. Really? Like we can't talk about culture and not talk about religion. I think it's insane that we don't talk about religion as therapists. It's like you specialize in it. Like you can special specialize in like a specific theological track, you know, but it's like why wouldn't we talk about religion? Because we can talk about religion without being like, hey, everyone needs to be a Christian. True. We all need to be Christian therapists or Jewish <laughs> therapists or Muslim therapists. Like, I feel like that's like what we're afraid of. And so we just don't talk about religion at all. Would you be willing to like talk about like where that came from inside of you? Like, the, that, like that. We shouldn't talk about religion. Oh, it wasn't like that. It was just like a... Um, I don't know. I think that it was more about like, this isn't about religion, but what you were talking. I I also know you, Lucas, that you like to talk, you like to like dive into politics and religion and some of these harder topics, which um, I think I just want to be mindful of making, of not turning this into a podcast about like religion and turning people off on like saying statistics that you're probably wrong sort of stuff. Well, but I didn't say that. No, and like, because that would be risky, but what I was very intentional to say is there's a 0% probability that any one of them is entirely right and the rest are entirely wrong. Sure. Which leaves space for, and what that points toward is a lot of them are probably right in many ways. I see what you're saying. I didn't interpret it that way, but I yeah. understand. So maybe uh, maybe we'll just start there. I'll okay. just say that again that way and clarify, and then we'll take yeah. it from there. Perfect. Okay. okay. Um. So, like, with there being, like, 450 religions in the world, um, the probability that one of them is entirely right and the rest of them are entirely wrong is, is zero. Like, there's no probability of that. But what I'm not saying there is they're all wrong. You know, it's like what's meaningful about that probability is there are probably a lot of things that a lot of those religious teachings are all right about, Um but there's probably not one that is completely right in its totality that would discount all of the other ones, you know? And so that notion of cultural humility is largely just creating some space to be okay with that, you know, and that not everything necessarily needs to be a threat, but because these things are so sensitive and sticky, yeah, it's like, that's just, it, it it's almost like an incentive to just avoid it and not talk about it altogether. As a therapist, I feel like it's, it's less scary to have conversations about culture versus like starting to talk about religion. And I know that religion is oftentimes a part of culture, but it's it's never not. But I think in some ways the part that the reason why I shy away from talking about religion in particular is because it, it, it's so hard to, know like I mean we talk in future episodes about like self-disclosure and and for some people they they don't want to I don't know if I don't know how to say this but like if if I have a client that's talking about 
about religion, it's really hard for them to not be like, well, what do you believe? And, and so I think for me, kind of avoiding any sort of self-disclosure or any sort of, you know, like topic of trying to say, well, I like skirting that topic. I think it's easier for me to just avoid talking about religion when, and, and that's, probably not the right way to do it because it is such a big part of a person's life but I think there is kind of like it feels really sticky yeah and I would say you just absolutely nailed like what what one of the problems is that I was talking about before Mm -hmm. is that like what you just said was like spot on to the common lived experience of this reality as it comes up clinically in session and because and and you get to that point of they are going to ask, well, what do you believe in? Mm-hmm. But when our graduate programs don't train students to know exactly what to do and how to manage that and see that process through, we just avoid it. Yeah. But in, in av- we're avoiding that because we're not sure how we would handle the self-disclosure component of it. We're, we're by avoiding it for that good reason. If you're not trained to know how to respond to that, you shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Like you were right to not do that. Mm-hmm. Um, But then we communicate implicitly to the client that that's out of bounds. Yeah. But I would say, and it's most problematic when it comes to religion, because, and and I would say religion is always a, it's a, it's a product of culture. You know, it's like what I was going back to earlier existentially of like how we use culture to make sense of this world. It's like religion was one of the first manifestations of that. Um, And not to say that it's all just a construct, um, because I believe culture is much more than a social construct. Um, it's like when it comes to religion, it's like that could be one of the most powerful facets of the person's identity. It's like I, I've worked with people who were, you know, very invested in a specific religious teaching. And it is like the filter of their entire experience of everything they think and do and act and behave. You know, it's like, so if we didn't talk about that all the time, and it's a, it was a, religion that I had to, um, you know, kind of invest in learning a bit more about so I could feel competent, but I would also own, I'm not terribly familiar with this, but like, let's dig in. Hmm. Um, you know, so it's like, I know how to go there with religion, but it wasn't because of the literature in my profession, you know, it was because of consulting with people who were as disgruntled as I was, but much older. And they already read all the books, you know, that I needed to read, but at least they kind of like gave me the roadmap for it. Um, so yeah, I think it, the, there's a lot of work I think we need to do when it comes to culture in clinical practice. Cause yeah, I mean, as of late, it feels, it does feel just very political. Um, and it's almost entirely governed by postmodern teachings of multiculturalism, which, you know, I won't get into the, I won't get into postmodernism right now. Um, but what I would say is because culture is so massive, um, it's, a huge disservice to talk about it through a singular viewpoint you know it's like we need to look at it through all the lenses not just the postmodern one or not just the modern one or the pre-modern one um and so i think that could be a good starting point you know if we were to start reconsidering how we go about teaching and using culture in clinical practice yep and being okay with being uncomfortable um and I, I get if uh, a young clinician or somebody who's just starting this career path uh, to f- not want to self-disclose or meet clients uh, there with these kind of like uh, challenging questions and ever-expanding questions uh, because you probably are not comfortable enough uh, with yourself being vulnerable and, and, and sharing that humility. That's a process yeah. that, that, that takes time to learn, and that's okay. But if you're starting and somebody talks about religion or whatever part of their life relates to their culture or how they grew up or their experiences, that it's okay to tell them, you know, I'm just starting and these are hard conversations <laughs> for me to have and sometimes I feel very uncomfortable but uh, the hope is that we both kind of learn to be in this space and be uncomfortable with it and I think that opens up a little bit 
where the client now understands where you're coming from. And then possibly there could be an exchange there with those uncomfortable moments. I, what I would say is when it comes to people who are like the most sincerely religious people, I would say have in, in many ways than what I've experienced. Like if you disclose to them that you have a different, you practice a different religion, more times than not, like they're the, they're the most like fine with that. It doesn't matter. It's like because mm-hmm. they're so secure in their mm-hmm. religion. Mm-hmm. Like they're so secure in it that like it's like, yeah, we get other people of different religions. Like that's fine. Um, and so like I think with a lot of the self-disclosure stuff, we we build it up as being more relevant and significant to the client than it actually is. And the reason we kind of build it, maybe one of the reasons we can tend to build it up and almost like put it on the client is because what's really going on there is like we don't know. We haven't fully flushed it out yet ourselves. Um, that's still kind of like a se- sensitive topic or like I'm just I'm not quite sure where I'm at with it. You know, but I think they're for one, when it comes with talking about this stuff with clients, which I always do, like their culture worldview is always the first thing I'm interested in. And that might be the only thing I'm interested in because I'll learn everything I need to learn by just really digging into to the worldview. And that's what I make it about, you know, and I don't mm-hmm. I don't do like uh you know, like the standard DA question everyone has to ask, like, you know, how has culture influenced your life? You know, it's like people, clients don't know how to answer that. No. Clients are just like, I uh, don't know. So what do you ask instead? Um, how do you make sense of this world that we're living in? Yeah. What do you think happens after we die? Hmm. You know, it's like I will ask one of those questions or both of those questions in every first session I have with a client, if, it, if not like one of the first questions I really, the first question I usually start with is like, how do you make sense of this world that we're living in? I love that. Yeah. That's great. Cause it's universal. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, that's not a sensitive topic. And it's like client, clients don't always know how to answer. It can be an overwhelming question, but it sets the tone that everything's in bounds. Like from that. here on out, it's like, cause I mean, and, and in many ways, I think my therapy is like spending nine months to four years answering that question. You know, and it's like by the time you can fully answer that, I think you're in a pretty good place. Um, yeah, and religion might be a part of that, but see culture is like larger than religion. Um, see them as the same thing, but like religion is just one of the ways that uh, culture helps people make sense of this world that we're living in and gives us a sense of significance and purpose and meaning and togetherness. Well, would you guys agree that culture can be used in the therapeutic space as something that could benef- be beneficial and productive and, and, and on a place for growth? But I will ask the same, you know, on a different note, can it be harmful? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Can oh, yeah. it be harmful to the relationship? Uh, and to the process of therapy. Yeah, and it's like, I think ethics, you know, it's like, I love ethics. I like ethics. I think when I think of our code of ethics, I see that as like my resource. You know, it's like, I I know it's ultimately there to protect the public and it's for clients, but it's like, those are the guidelines of how to stay in balance and do this. It's like, there's not an ethical statute I disagree with. You know, some of them like in the particulars um, can vary, but it's very clear in the code of ethics it's like do not impose your culture worldview on a client Mm -hmm. don't do it it's like that's not what therapy is um and i think we if we take that seriously um well one it's like we have to know what our cultural worldview is we have to know all of the ways in which we practice that might be influenced by our cultural worldview and that's where, again, like I think postmodernism makes it trickier because postmodernism is taught as an academic like paradigm, you know, but it's a political ideology. And so everything that comes out of postmodernism is a cultural worldview. And so like even practicing from those models can be an imposition of that onto the client in some ways. Um, so I think it gets problematic when therapists do it, but they don't know that that's what they're doing. Um and then the extreme form of it, which I think is pretty rare, is like, it's like you could be a Christian counselor. Um, it's like advertise yourself as a Christian counselor so people know to go to you for Christian counseling. You know, it's like don't be a quiet Christian counselor with a general practice, you know, and 
uptown Minneapolis and every client who comes in, you're actually counseling them through Christianity, Mm -hmm. whether they know it or not. Like that's like, I don't think that happens a lot. That would be the extreme form of it. I think it's more risky and problematic when people, therapists do it unknowingly uh, because they lose sight of the fact that, yeah, what they're doing clinically is more informed by culture than like science and healthcare. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm learning so much from both of you. And I just, I love like, I feel like I'm kind of a fly on a wall in some ways and just taking it all in and I appreciate it. There's so much. There is so much. And before we dive into kind of the next topic around this, um, I, we're at time. And so I'm feeling like we have to do a part two. Yeah. So stay tuned. We are going to release this episode, but then we are absolutely going to have to have you back, Zoel, for a part two so we can dive in. I feel like we've only scratched the surface. Yeah. We need to dive in more I mean, this. Is this. Just, this is just our day job. So oh. I love it. Awesome. Okay. We're on calendars right now. What? We're on the calendar right now. We're on the clock. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Keep moving. This was wonderful. Um, yeah, I think thanks for bringing this topic to us so well. Uh, I think we might have even said this in the break before too. Is like all this episode is going to do is open a ginormous can of worms. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And we've definitely done that. And I'm excited about it because these things are relevant. Um, so, yeah. See you at part two. Thank you. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Thank you.